Hey, uh, we are uh, doing part two of a two-part series called Making Change, and we're talking about generosity, and we're talking about the discipline of generosity, and I know it generates a lot of stress and a lot of hearts when we talk about the disciplines of giving. It generates a lot of stress personally. It might generate a lot of stress in your marriage, right, honey? I mean... There's tension, and I just, I, I just want to let it go. First off, I'm a volunteer. I get nothing, right? So I have no agenda. I literally, like Brandon said, literally want something for you, not something from you. Last week, Brandon gave us a list. It was two columns long, took the entire screen of all the great things that are happening at this church, the momentum, the growth, everything's great. But we also came back with deep prayer time because we don't have enough fuel to keep up with the momentum. And so we're having this series here, but what I want to do is come back to this very, frankly, provocative statement that Brandon introduced last week. We don't want something from you. We want something for you. Now, we don't talk about that. We don't because it seems selfish, right? I mean, it's like we're Christians, and so we're not going to talk about being selfish and what's in it for me. Peter asked, what's in it for me, Jesus? We gave up everything. So I think it's okay this morning. Let's just let it go. And let's just, what's in it for me? What? This giving thing. I mean, God, why would you tell me you want me to give back something you already gave me? What's How is this helpful to me? Earlier this week, uh, I met with Miss Kim. Miss Kim leads our children's ministry, and uh, I finished it. Amen. Our outstanding children's ministry. And we were talking about pedagogy. Pedagogy is a funny word for how to teach. How do you teach children? What's the pedagogy for teaching children? And uh, we came to this passage that I'm about to show you in Deuteronomy. Now, Moses, Moses is speaking here. And Moses recognized that even little children, even back in the day, are going to ask the question, why? Why do we do this? Why do we do these disciplines? He anticipated it. So I want to learn, I want us to learn, I want us to set the framework, the groundwork, through what Moses gave us. So here we go. Uh, This is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Moses says, when your son asks you in the time to come, what is the meaning of these testimonies in these statues and these rules that the Lord God has commanded you? Why do we have to give? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and he showed us signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there. And the Lord commanded us to do all of these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. For our good always. All the disciplines, the discipline of prayer, the discipline of Sabbath, the discipline of solitude, the discipline of reading scripture, all of the disciplines, the sacraments, the discipline of taking communion, all of the disciplines are for our benefit always. So the question is, do we trust that the discipline of stewardship and giving is also for our benefit always? Let me put this in a modern day context. You know, I'm of a certain age and I'm starting to worry about certain things. And my doctor tells me I need to worry about certain things. And one of those certain things is cholesterol. Cholesterol. Now, there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and I spent way too much time studying cholesterol on the internet this week. There's LDL and there's HDL, but bad cholesterol generates plaque, and plaque gets into your your vascular system, and then that can cause all kinds of problems. Nothing good happens when your plumbing is plugged up. Nothing good. Heart attacks and strokes and all kinds of things. And so the doctor, you can't tell. I can't look at you and say, hmm, your plaque levels look awfully high. 
You can't tell. You can't look at yourself and go, I'm feeling low cholesterol today. The doctor has to do a test. He has to do a blood test. She has to do a blood test. And she puts it into an algorithm. And the algorithm, based on some other things, but cholesterol being the lead indicator in the algorithm, based on your age and your sex and if you smoke. and But the algorithm will predict, are you going to have a heart attack in the next 10 years? And if the doctor finds out, yes, your score in the algorithm is high, the doctor is probably, I would expect, I would hope, the doctor is going to come to you and say, hey, uh, concerning news, your score is really high, you're probably going to have a heart attack, but I got great news. If you just make some changes, if you just incorporate some new disciplines, you know, stop eating the red meat, stop eating the fried food, or maybe just reduce it quite a bit. Maybe if you just implement some discipline and you start eating maybe some fish and some fruit and some fiber, you, you can lower the bad cholesterol and keep the plaque from building up, and you're going to live a happy life. Isn't that great news? But the problem is, usually when we hear news like that, we think about what we have to give up. Not the benefit that we're going to get over the long haul. I get to live versus, really, I got to give up cheeseburgers and fries? And like I said, we can't tell if our cholesterol level is high. So we do things. We're like, well, you know, I'm going to go ahead and have that double cheeseburger and the fries, and I'm going to really carbo load today, and it's going to be all good. I'll start that diet thing tomorrow. I'll do it later. You trust your doctor we all trust our doctor. Are we willfully disobeying our doctor when we, you know, deviate from the diet? No, no. But you'll say, I trust my doctor, but here, here, I know what's best for me. I know what's right and wrong for me. How'd that work out in the garden? How did that work out in the story in the garden? when Adam and Eve wanted to determine and to set what was right for them. There's a book um, called Practicing the Way. Well, actually, I don't, I don't want to get there yet. All disciplines, all disciplines lead to benefits. All discipline lead to benefits. But there are some implications to these disciplines. The implications are you will change your lifestyle. You will change the practices of your life. And one thing I discovered because the doctor told me I had to make certain diet changes. At first it was really hard and give up gluten, give up bread, give up beer. I mean, I like. But once I implemented those diet changes in my life, I started to feel a whole lot better. And those disciplines became easier over time. Disciplines will become easier over time. So disciplines. There's a book, uh, very popular right now, several Bible studies in this church uh, focused on this book. It's called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. And uh, he pointed out something really, really interesting, and I had to prove him right. He noticed that in the New Testament, the word Christian is mentioned only three times. The word disciple, those who implement the disciplines, 267 times. Jesus didn't say, go and make Christians. He said, go and make disciples. Follow me, become a disciple. And it's a pretty provocative question because I think there's people that you would go up and say, hey, what do you believe? I'm a Christian. If somebody comes up to you and they say, well, what do you believe? Try saying this, I'm a disciple. I'm an apprentice of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. You're probably going to get some weird looks. That's going to be a little bit strange. But that's what we're called to be. See, the challenge is there's a whole lot of people, Jesus said, that would say, 
Many call me Lord, Lord, but I do not know them because they did not do the will of my Father. There's a big difference between being a fan and being a disciple. Now, also showing my age, I'll give another analogy. Since 1970, with the release of Layla and Assorted Love Songs, I've been a huge fan of Eric Clapton. Huge fan. If you come to my house, you will know that I am a fan of Eric Clapton. There is an oil painting in my house of Eric Clapton. Layla and Assorted Love Songs hangs over our fireplace. There's even a picture in the study of me the time I got to meet Eric Clapton. My son's middle names are Eric and Patrick after Eric Patrick Clapton. In 1992, MTV did MTV Unplugged with Eric Clapton and it rocked my world. Actually, it acoustic my world because now all of a sudden, Eric's music became a whole lot more accessible to me. I can't play like this with all those pedals and stuff, but I could get an acoustic guitar. And I went out and I got this book, and I studied the book, the music book, and I learned to play every single song. I was trying to be a disciple of Eric Clapton. <laughs> I even wore clothes. My hair was, I mean, I tried to look like Eric Clapton. But I stopped practicing. I stop practicing. And anybody who hears me play knows I am not a disciple of Eric Clapton. <laughs> you can tell by the results of the way I perform. We kind of do that with our Bibles. It's all written right there. This is what you do. But if you don't do it, if you don't practice, you're never going to be a disciple. That time I got to meet Eric Clapton, it was before a concert. I can go into, I'll skip you all the details. I'm walking in the room before his show. He's sitting on a sofa. He's got his legs kicked up on a, a coffee table. He's got his silver strat unplugged, and he's practicing scales. He's doing pentatonics. And all I could say, because I was the only one in there, is no way. And he bounces up, lays the strat, this is 2008, on the coffee table, comes up, shakes my hand, and I said, Mr. Clapton, I don't mean to embarrass you, but I am the biggest fan. My sons are named Eric and Patrick, <laughs> and my dog is named Layla. <laughs> and he said, I I've never heard that before. <laughs> and then, that. imagine if I had finished with an Eric I really want to be your disciple. Security? Right this way? Jesus invites us to be a disciple. He invites us to be a disciple. And we have, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, disciple. It's all in the books. We want to be like Jesus. So let's look how discipleship can benefit us. Because the difference between being a fan and being a disciple is practice. But what do we get if we practice? What's in it for us? First thing, generous people are happier people. Generous people are happier people. This is what Jesus had to say about this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I don't know about you. I like receiving. But it's even better. It's even better if we're giving. Blessed means happy. We've, we've all heard the verse, but do we believe the verse? If I'm being honest, there is some satisfaction in the pursuit of stuff. I like pursuing stuff. Last night, 11 p.m., I'm pursuing a new Baltimore Ravens cat. The best deal I could get. Go Ravens. It was fun. I didn't make the purchase, but it was fun. You know, I'm pursuing stuff. Sometimes when you get the stuff, it's fun. But not Laura. I've already got three Baltimore Ravens hats. 
Why do I think I need a fourth? It's an endless cycle of consumerism. We're, we're, we're supposed to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. We're, not, we're being formed no matter what. We shouldn't be conformed. We need to be transformed. Disciplines help us do this. Generosity helps us do this. We know this principle is true. I believe every single person here wants to be generous. Every single person online, every single person not here wants to be generous. How can I make that bold statement? Because we're all made in the image of God. And God is generous. For God so loved the world that he... It's in you. It's in you. You want to be generous. But until we do the disciplines, it's hard. I want to play like Eric Clapton. But until I discipline myself in practice, it's not going to happen. Second benefit. Giving allows participation in God's work and worship. This is from Paul. It's from 2 Corinthians, the second letter he wrote to the church at Corinth. We're going to look a lot at Paul from here on in. This service that you perform, you Corinthians, this service you perform is not only supplying the needs of Lord's people, the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Look what's happening. Not only are you helping people with your generosity, it's generating worship. It's generating praise. Because of this service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. Yes, I believe. I believe Jesus died for my sins. All the Christians in here, all the disciples in here, we all say, Amen. So also should we believe what he preaches, what he teaches about generosity and willingness to give. Verse 14, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you. Generosity leads to praise. Generosity leads to us being able to participate and see God at work just like Brandon showed us last week in two columns on a great big screen. Third, giving secures our future. <laughs> I love this. This is Paul again. He's writing to Timothy. Timothy was a preacher, so he's telling Timothy how to, how, how to, how to be a church leader, how to be a preacher. And he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Command those who are rich in this world. Now, I, a lot of us would probably say, well, that's for the rich people. What's the definition of rich? A little bit more. <laughs> I'll never get there. Look, let's just be honest. We hit the lottery being born here in North America. Relative to the rest of the world, they look at us, we're so rich. We have houses for our cars. Some of us have more than one car. We're rich, but we don't feel rich. I don't feel like my cholesterol's high. But it is. It's true. We're rich. Many of us are rich. Now, I know, I know. Let me, lots of disclaimers. I know. There are people here today that are looking for work. They're looking for a job. We're with you in prayer. We understand you cannot give right now. We get it. There are people here who live on sales commissions, and they're waiting for the next big deal. We get it. We understand. There is, there is no condemnation going back four weeks ago to when we started Romans. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These are principles. But your current status may make it impossible for you to live the principle right now. If you can't live it right now, learn the principle 
So when you can live it, you will. Giving secures our future. Command them to do good. So rich people, do good. Be rich in good deeds. And be generous. And willing to share it. That's your stuff. That's your money. It's the condo. It's the house. It's the resources. It's the access you have. Be rich. He's telling rich people how to be rich. Be rich in good deeds. And what happens? In this way, you will lay up treasure for yourself as a firm foundation for the coming age and so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. I've looked at multiple versions of this. This is not just treasures in heaven. This is life that is truly life now as well. Because we'll be happy. Because we'll be joyful. Because we'll be freed from debt and the agony of all that stuff that needs to be maintained. And finally, fourth, giving protects us. Again, Paul talking to his apprentice, Timothy. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered off from the faith and they pierce themselves with many grief. This does not sound like happiness. This is the doctor coming in saying, you scored really high and you have a high risk of heart disease. This is the warning. Please implement these disciplines. So now, without surveying all the hundreds and thousands of texts on the disciplines of giving, we're going to focus just on two, maybe three passages. And I want to show you what the disciplines of giving are based on what I've researched in the New Testament. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 16, 12. Now, the reason I picked this, Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote to one of the churches he started. They were having lots of issues. I mean, they, 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 frankly, they were just messed up. But in the preamble, in the opening of his letter, he says, this is meant to be read not only to the church at Corinthians, or Corinth, it's also meant to be read to all the saints everywhere. I think that's us. So I think we, it's fair, I think, for us to look at this passage in Corinthians and see, does it apply to us? Imagine Paul is writing this letter. It's, you're in Corinth, they're reading it out loud, and you get to hear it because it's for your ears. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, we're not calling it a tithe, we're not calling it an offering, this is a collection for the saints. As I directed the churches of Galatia, oh, this isn't just for you, Corinth, and everybody else. This is also what I told everybody at Galatia. So Paul is giving us a universal ecumenical principle here for everybody. This is what I directed them. On the first day of the week, every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. What Paul is doing here is he's saying, hey, store it up, save it up, get ready. When I come, I will then take the money. And this was going back to Jerusalem to supply the saints in Jerusalem. He didn't want to have to come in at the last minute and take up a special offering and make up for the deficit in the fourth quarter of the year. He who has ears, let him hear. So, Three things I pick up from this. This is me. I made this up. PPP. Prioritized, planned, and proportional giving. Prioritized, planned, and proportional giving. Prioritized. Paul said, on the first day of the week, 
This is a priority on the first day of the week. Don't wait till the end of the week and see if you got anything left over. We don't give people we love leftovers. It's prioritized. Planned. You have to have a plan. What is our plan for giving? If I don't have a plan to give, if I don't set aside a certain sum, then I will consume. This is Jody 101. Maybe it applies to you too. I'm so blessed. I learned at a very early age, give first, save second, live on the rest. And it was more like, okay, give this amount. I'm not going to say the amount. It's a percentage. Save this much, but you get to live on this. Is it graphic enough? Do you understand? Give, save, live. I got to learn that early on, and it makes it easier for me now. And I get to experience the joy now. The joy that comes, the blessing that comes with giving because it's prioritized and it's planned. And finally, it's proportional. This, we, get, we get all hung up on this. Proportional. There's a parenthetical phrase Paul inserts there. He says, as he may prosper. It's not a flat tax. Everybody give 50 bucks. Some assume it's a flat percentage. We can go back to tithing, and there's debates on both sides. Is the tithe still relevant? Jesus did talk about tithing. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But Paul doesn't say a specific percentage, but he does say proportional. A portion based on your ability. It's proportional. So PPP, prioritized, planned, and proportional. I believe those are the three major elements in the discipline of generosity. Now, that's not really that complex or that hard. But Paul had to write another letter. So we get the letter of 2 Corinthians. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. And you're going to see, I, <laughs> I got to tell you, there is no sleep on Saturday night for the preacher. There's none. I, I don't know. Maybe the best thing we could do for our preachers is never ask them out to lunch on Sunday. Because I'm telling you, that nap is the best nap I ever get. Because I would lay awake all night, and this week in particular, this is, you know, the sermon that none of us really want. It's kind of like talking about sex with your kids. You, kinda, you know it's important, but you don't want to do it, and it's going to be a little bit awkward. But this morning, I was laying awake. It was about 4 a.m., and I'm like, I, God, I don't know. I know all your word is true, but this seems counterintuitive, and... Ugh, it was so great. Let me, let, let me show you what I discovered. 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 6 and 7. Paul, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. We all, we've heard this before, right? I mean, the principle of, of, of farming. The more seed you throw, the more that's going to grow. We get this. Okay, easy. Got it. Paul, that makes sense. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What if cheerful is an output and not a required input? For 55 years, I've heard, God loves a cheerful giver. I'm so happy to give to you. Sometimes I'm not. At the beginning of the year, Bernice and I set our budget. What are we going to give? To, and, and, we say, and every, every week and every month in proportional giving, this is what we do. So sometimes the giving is automated. And, I, you know, frankly, the cheerfulness comes when we see the results of the giving. Put it this way, 
mom's birthday or some other loved one's birthday, right? Unless you planned for it, unless you prioritized it, unless you've set a certain sum of money away, you're going to feel like, oh, I have to get her something I forgot. Oh, I don't have enough money. I hate to put that on a credit card. Oh, it takes all the cheerfulness out. The cheerfulness is the result. Look what it says, going back to the verse. Each individual, it's your own decision to practice the discipline. It's your own decision to practice the discipline. Decided, once again, decided. I have pre-decided. I have committed. I am going to do this. Each individual decides. They do PPP. They have discipline in their heart. It's private. It's not public. Jesus condemned the Pharisees. Oh, they were great, excellent tithers. They tied their cumin and their dill pickles. They tithed everything. They were very, very good at tithing. They were very specific. But he said, woe to you because you do that, but you've forgotten the most important things. You don't have any joy. You're sitting there miserable. You're treating your giving like a tax. It's not a tax. It's an opportunity to protect your heart and in God's economy. See, in the world's economy, we think, if I give, I lose, right? There's only, here's a dollar, it's either my dollar or your dollar. In God's economy, there's abundance. There's abundance. So I can give a dollar and I benefit because I protect my heart and I get to feel the joy and I get to be blessed and I get to be happy and other people benefit and I get to be a part of the kingdom of God, which we pray about. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We get to do that. It needs to come from our heart. It's private, not public. It's motivated by love. Why? Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. So to sum up the disciplines, we've got this slide. You take these four icons, you prioritize it, you plan it, you figure out the appropriate proportions. And by the way, that tithe thing, you know, 10%, right? Abraham is way before Moses, so we can't say the Mosaic law went away, so tithe goes away. But I think if we do that, we're really missing the whole point and we're being distracted. Jesus demanded of the rich young ruler, give it all. And then he did it himself. Jesus modeled discipleship by giving it all. Prioritized, planned, proportional, and then we get to be cheerful. Then we get to be cheerful. There's many more things we could preach about today and we could go in depth and this could be a 10-week series on generosity and this could be like, well, I don't know how to get, out. this seems impossible, I can't get out of debt and, and, and I know, I know, I know, I know. Maybe you didn't get to grow up like me where, I, you know, my very first paycheck I was giving and then saving and uh, I, I, I drilled into me, stay out of debt. Maybe, maybe you got tricked. Maybe you got trapped. There's a, 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 a woman in our congregation I was speaking to this week. Um, she, she got involved. The, the student debt took over. And the free credit cards, it took over. And then she met a guy and she said, he, he said, hey, uh, we're going we're gonna to give every week. And she said, what? Are you crazy? And she said, Jody, the debt just melted away. I don't know how. There's another woman in our church, single, wants to buy a house someday. And she decided she would start giving on a regular basis, a PPP basis. Yeah, she wants a house. 
But she's giving, and she says, Jody, I feel the peace that surpasses all understanding because now I know God's in control. I have to rely on him. That was the problem with the rich young ruler who had everything. He was trusting in his ability and not God's ability. So maybe you're in that situation. Maybe you're in that situation. Just start with five bucks. Start with one. Start with one percent. Start the discipline. Start with the easiest of scales. And you'll be amazed how God can bless that and grow you. And you go from 1% to 2% to what? Now, maybe you're like me. Hey, I've been doing this all my life. And you know, I was taught the 10% and you're stuck at 10%. Some of us need to be a little bit like Spinal Tap and move from 10 to 11. And 12 and 13 and beyond. Or maybe everything. And again, I know not everybody can participate and do this right now. But here's what I don't want. Maybe you have some regrets. Oh, gee, if only I had started this when I was... If only I had implemented these disciplines, then I would be able to... Don't miss the next season. Don't miss the next season of your life and beyond. Start small and start practicing. And welcome the invitation that Jesus offers to become a disciple. Father God, a message like this hits in so many difficult places. Thank you for giving me the insight this morning that cheerfulness may not be a requirement, maybe it's a result. We pray that each of us individually would decide in our hearts with your encouragement what to give and make this a discipline we practice on a regular basis.